Non-Invasive Cardiovascular Monitoring by Brianne Johnson. Healthcare workers in all healthcare settings should always adhere to the latest World Health Organization guidelines on hand hygiene and barrier precautions before and after contact with a patient, bodily fluids, or patient surroundings. For more information, please watch our video entitled Hand Hygiene. Introduction Hi, my name is Bree Johnson and I'm a nurse here at the Pediatric Medical Surgical Intensive Care Unit in Boston Children's Hospital. I am here today to talk to you about non-invasive monitoring of the cardiovascular system. Non-invasive cardiovascular monitoring includes techniques used to measure heart activity and circulation that do not require the insertion of any devices into the patient. If you master the skills of non-invasive monitoring, you will be able to safely care for any patient. Ideally, all patients in the critical care setting should be on a continuous cardiac monitor. This would include monitoring regularly their heart rate, their heart rhythm, and also their blood pressure at appropriate intervals, intervals deemed for that patient. It is absolutely acceptable to use a non-invasive blood pressure technique such as the blood pressure cuff. You should document your child's vital signs at a minimum of every hour or with any critical and clinical change. Placement of monitoring devices. Now we'll talk about how to effectively apply and use the cardiac monitor. Each monitor is going to be a little bit different but typically you'll either have between three to five leads to work with. On this patient, you'll be able to see that we have three leads available to us. We have a white lead that is placed on the right upper extremity or chest. The left upper extremity here has a black lead that can again go on the left shoulder or anywhere in the left chest region. Next, you'll need a grounding wire, which should typically go on the left lower portion of the child's abdomen or chest. These will all work together to gain an electric picture of the child's heart rate and rhythm. One easy way that we often say to remember is that the white must go on the right and they rhyme. The black is typically the left upper portion and then the lower portion is the red. Here, we would say red is like fire, and the smoke or the black is always over the fire. Sometimes you'll see the ground lead as green, and you can remember that by remembering that grass would be on the ground. The most important thing is that you match the lead placement with the appropriate place on the cardiac monitoring wire. In other words, wherever your black lead is on the patient should match the black placement on the cable. In similarity, the white cable should feed in to where the white portion on the cable is. And finally, the grounding wire, the red or the green, will need to match the cable over here. There is often a picture or colors indicating the appropriate place. If you do not accurately correct connect these, you will not gain an accurate picture on your cardiac monitor. It's also a helpful trick to know that you can place these leads on both the front of the patient as well as on their back. Just keep in mind the back's a mirror image, and so again, make sure that you place the leads appropriately correlating to the right or left side. It is also one helpful side trick to note, any wet cloths or things that are placed on the patient may interfere with your reading. Monitoring cardiac rhythm. Now we're gonna move over to taking a look at the cardiac monitor. One of the things you'll be doing is of monitoring and evaluating your patient's rhythm, or their cardiac rhythm. This becomes most important when you want to look at how the arrhythmia or the normal rhythm is affecting the patient's hemodynamics or cardiac output. An arrhythmia becomes critically important if you start to see a deterioration in the patient's blood pressure or their ability to perfuse their body. Some of the things that may alter the cardiac rhythm could be hypoxia or low oxygen, an electrolyte disturbance or imbalance, a toxin that may have been ingested or inhaled, a mispositioned or misaligned central line, or it could be congenital heart disease or a surgical procedure which has triggered the arrhythmia. Lastly, you always want to keep in mind that it may be artifact and an artificially induced arrhythmia you see or seeing on the monitor. As a result, you always want to make sure that when this monitor alarms, you assess your patient first. Safety Guidelines 
So that brings us to reviewing some basic safety guidelines in using a cardiac monitor. First and foremost, you want to make sure that your alarms are turned on. The monitor will be no good to you if the patient decompensates and it doesn't alarm for you. Next, you want to set the alarm limits so that they are appropriate for the patient's age and condition. You'll want to utilize the patient's baseline vital signs to establish what you set your alarm limits at. For example, as here you can see your patient has a heart rate starting in the 90s, so you will want to make sure that you set a low limit that isn't at 100. Otherwise, the monitor will continuously alarm and you will not be able to use this information to determine when you have a true alarm that's in need of attention. Traditionally, we teach nurses to set limits about 20% above and below the patient's baseline high and low rates. However, you will need to use your clinical judgment each time. Finally, as stated before, if the alarm rings, make sure to assess your patient immediately. You want to determine first and foremost if the alarm is even real, and then determine what your most appropriate intervention will be. Just remember, a monitor is only as good as the person who is using it. Features of the cardiac monitor. All right, now we'll take a better look at the monitor. You'll notice that the top line is the green line. This is going to give you your heart rate and your heart rhythm. At the very top left corner of the monitor, the monitor is going to tell you which lead your monitor view is in. Typically, there are three views. You can have lead one, two, or three. If the leads are placed appropriately, typically lead two is the most accurate view that you'll want to take a look at. You can, however, flip through each of the different views in order to get the cleanest sort of rhythm on your monitor. Sometimes different views are useful in gaining different information. You want to choose whichever view is going to give you the most solid tracing. There are basically three main components to the EKG strip or the rhythm strip. Here you'll see first there is a P wave. That is the smallest wave just before the large spike. The large spike is known as the QRS. Finally, after the QRS comes the T. You want to check in your ECG tracing that all three of these are present. If any of them are absent or shaped in an odd fashion, this will help you to identify an abnormal rhythm. There will be some minor variability dep dependent on the child's age or their disease condition. The P wave is important because it will help you identify issues that are originating in the atrial part of the heart. You want to make sure there's a P for every QRS wave. Next you'll want to assess the QRS wave. This will show you your ventricular depolarization. You'll want to note if that complex is either wide, narrow, or within a normal range. Sometimes you'll see an abnormality with the QRS wave that will indicate something called a PVC, or a premature ventricular contraction. This is actually a normal finding in many children. However, you'll want to note the frequency of these beats, as if there are too many of them, that will become abnormal. Or if there's many right in a row, you'll want to notify someone as well. The T wave will be following the QRS wave. It's the final wave in the ECG tracing. Typically, in the view two, you'll see that as a positive little hill. However, in some of the other views, you may see it upside down, or what we call an inverted T wave. Sometimes an inverted T wave can be normal, and in certain views, it will be normal. However, it's important to pay attention because if you're in view two or lead two, and you see an inverted T wave, this may indicate some sort of a problem. Evaluating cardiac rhythm. The best way to evaluate a full rhythm in your patient is to perform a full 12 lead ECG or electrocardiogram. However, this isn't always possible. Typically, a 3 lead or a 5 lead ECG tracing that you'll obtain from your bedside cardiac monitor will be effective in identifying whether your patient is experiencing a normal cardiac rhythm or has developed some sort of abnormality. It is best practice to obtain a 12 lead EKG if you notice that there is any sort of abnormality that is new onset and has developed in your patient. You may not always know what the rhythm is that you're seeing, but it is most important to know what normal looks like so that you can identify the onset of an abnormality. 
there are a few life-threatening arrhythmias that we should take note of. The first of these that many of you have probably heard of is called ventricular tachycardia or VTAC. You'll notice here that the QRS wave has become quite wide. This is a great example of a type of rhythm that looks very regular but is actually incredibly dangerous. Once again, this requires emergency intervention. The child may need CPR and you will immediately need to intervene to try and reverse this rhythm. Next, we want to take a look at something called ventricular fibrillation, otherwise known as V-fib. V-fib will appear on your monitor like a very coarse and irregular sort of pattern. Once again, this is a very dangerous and lethal rhythm. This is considered a non-perfusing rhythm. The child will need CPR and you will again need to immediately intervene to try and reverse this rhythm. Of course, there is asystole where the heart has stopped completely. You'll notice in asystole that the line for the ECG tracing is essentially flat. This indicates that there is no electric activity taking place from the heart and this child needs immediate resuscitation. You'll also notice that the heart rate on the monitor is reading zero. It is also important to note that this is one of those alarms that may go off in your patient's room and will require assessment and you may walk in to find that simply the child is awake and playing and has pulled off one of the leads. Again, just to reiterate, this is the reason you must always assess your patient first before intervening based on an alarm on a monitor. So, overall, as you're assessing your ECG tracing and your heart rate, you want to take note of two things. The heart rate, which is the number in green at the top of the screen, which should also correlate to the pulse, which is the yellow number that is reading off of your oxygen saturation probe. Then you'll want to trend and follow your patient's ECG rhythm and follow their cardiac rhythm to ensure that they're in a normal sinus rhythm or if they've developed a new onset arrhythmia that you do the necessary interventions to both work that up and rectify the situation. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.